Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're continuing our series on developing collection with Amber and Legolas. Now, today was uh, a sort of milestone day, if you will, and a very important day for him because it was the first training day that he's actually able to maintain a good degree of collection in all three gates. So, uh, for him, that was very difficult. As you know, this is a very big horse um, with a very huge stride. Before Amber got him, he'd been broken over in the neck. So, of course, it took the year and a half, two years just to cure that. But you'll see here today that he's quite able to come up into collection in all three gates now without breaking over in the neck and staying pretty much. Uh, connected over his top line most of the time. So here she's just starting out. She's already done uh, five or ten minutes of just walking him around, just letting him stretch out. So we're, we pick it up from here. And what you'll notice today is how regular his gates have become. Um, of course, there she's just beginning to touch the reins a little bit. So, of course, he goes through a little process. Oh, I'm waking up. I need to do something. And but, of course, he immediately just moves right ahead of her leg and starts to soften the jaw and pull. Now, you notice we are riding this horse in a double bridle still. We do that because he was, um, when he came to Amber, the people that owned him had taught him to, not taught him to, but had let him get away with uh, breaking away from them. He would bolt, and if you tried to canter, he would just bolt away 900 miles an hour, very recklessly and dangerously. So he, we still deal with little elements of that from time to time. But it's very important when we work with horses that have, de have developed these kind of you know, techniques that they've used against their riders, it's just very important that they never get away with them again. You know, so if he scares somebody else and they get off of him, you know, that would never uh, do, or even just the idea that he can, has to get over that idea of bolting away. So that's why she still uses the double bridle a little bit with, with this horse when, when we're working the canter. Uh, mostly it's just because uh, you know, something can still set him off. Now, it's very rare and... Uh, I'm sure it will not be long before he'll be able to do everything in the snaffle without, we'll, you know, in other words, we, we won't need that safety break every now and then. I think we're just about at that point now with him. So you can see here he starts to come up into a very nice working walk. There's no tension in his body. Look how relaxed the underside of the neck is. And you'll see here when you watch Amber throughout this, uh, of course it slips some from time to time, but she mostly is riding off of the snaffle. Um, all of the time when there's usually a, a little slack in the curb rein, which is just exactly how you should do it. So here he goes into a very nice half pass in the walk, and I notice how nicely he's able to take that bend. You can just literally see him bending around here entire leg. That can never happen unless the horse's back is lifted. These are the things we have to remember. So before you could ever begin to attempt to do a half pass, the horse's back must be up in the right position. So he struggles there. You can see he has little moments where he struggles a little bit and, and loses it for a moment, but he comes right back into the position that he's supposed to be in. This is a very big horse, as I say, and some of these exercises like this, he's also fairly straight behind. Um, were he trained in any other fashion than the way we're doing here, he, you know, he would look very post-legged behind. But the fact that he's working over his back allows us to maximize you know, the thrust that we can get out of a fairly straight hind leg and really change the whole way the horse is moving. So you can see there how she just has a little moment where she brings her shoulder back and touches with the leg just to lighten her seat and at the same time very quickly bring the horses back up under her. And of course, notice after she did that, you'll you see that he gets a much deeper stretch. So what she's doing when she's doing that is actually closing her upper thigh. It's like a yoga stretch where you stretch back over a ball so your seat actually becomes lighter in the saddle as you give that little upwards pluck underneath that brings the horse back up underneath you. Once again, he comes into this pretty nice stable working walk here. And you see he struggles just for a moment, like by the, as she's asking him to come up into a little more collected walk here. You see he struggles for just a little bit of a moment, like trying to figure out, oh, do I have enough strength to do this? And then he gets it very nicely right there. So remember, we're working at the far end of what this horse is capable of doing. So, you know, you'll see him struggling a little bit. But you'll notice that whenever he does, if he doesn't come into what we're asking him to do, which he did there beautifully and got connected over his back and stayed there, we just immediately come back to the stretch. We never try to force the issue. You just have to get in your mind, just from the very beginning of training horses, that forcing them to do anything is, is, is never very productive in the long run. Because it always has bad results in how the horse moves, which of course has detrimental effect on how uh, how long the horse stays sound. 
you can force a whole horse to do a lot of things, but if they're if you are forcing them, they're always tense. So that tension alone, as anybody who trains athletes knows, tension is what causes a lot of injuries. So once again, you can see here now he's settled quite nicely over that bridle, makes a nice bending turn around there, came up for just a second, and she's going into the half pass here. Again, and that works out very nicely. So now she's going to do a little counter change of hand this time. So you can see he has moments where he starts to drop over a little bit with his pole, but she brings him right back up again. Very nice in that, holding the bend very nicely around her leg, as you can see. So very nice there. So he's just begun to do these counter changes of hand. Now you can see how he got a little bit short there, so of course she comes right back to the stretch and re-lengthens that walk back out and gets the hocks working again and really swinging over the back. Just like a person going to the gym, you know, if, you, if you're doing weight sets, for instance, you get to the top and when you get to your highest weight, you start to struggle. And as soon as you start to struggle, you should stop doing it or you will hurt yourself. Anybody who knows anything about working out knows that. It was the same thing with the horse. So we have to be constantly pushing the envelope a little bit, if you will, of what the horse can do, asking it for a little bit more. But as soon as you reach, you know, that point, you know, once again, if the resistance, if you can't straighten the resistance out within a few moments, you must come back and just release that tension, knowing that you simply didn't set the horse up well enough to get what you were asking for, or it wasn't well enough developed to get what you're asking for. So instead of trying to fight your way through it, as I said, you simply come back, let the horse stretch again, and then come back again. And very often, just that act is enough. You know, once the horse locks itself up a little bit, you always have to just let it go and release a little bit. The muscles start to fatigue. You know, when they start holding themselves against you, bracing a little bit, that wears out all the wrong muscles. But here he comes into a nice walk, and once again, notice how throughout the day today, he, he stays, and the next day is out long. So what you're going to see here is the first time we've actually been able to put together a little piaf with this horse. It, it's taken a long time. I've been working on it with him on and off now for a couple of years, trying from time to time. But these big horses like he was, he was, he was what we call a a foot planter. In other words, he's a big heavy horse who would just kind of plant his feet in the ground and you were just going to have to do too much to try to get him to activate. So we have kept going away from the Piaf, trying it from time to time. You know, and then finally, you know, we've, we've approached it kind of from two directions with this big heavy horse. It's coming out of movement, so he's always moving instead of going from a standstill, which is why, what you'll see us do here. He will come to a standstill a little bit. But you'll see that for the first time here, Connect, I notice I always give the horse the a little bit of reward first just for letting me come over to him because I don't want the horse to start seeing the whip and getting all afraid at this level. Soon as soon as he trusts us and he gets what we're doing, that won't be a problem and I, and I won't need to continue doing that. But you'll see here today he has now finally understood. He starts stepping diagonal pairs. You can see how it's a struggle for this big horse, but how nicely he keeps that going. Now, that's it. So once I have that much, I, it's licked. I mean, those are lovely, lovely connected strides. And so from there, I will just gradually build more thrust in it. So now I can say this horse, you know, ha, ha, he knows what Piaf is now and what his job is supposed to be. And now very gradually as we build his strength, you'll see him start to jump off the ground. So that was also a big day for him to get that. I mean, we've worked on it over and over again with him. And it was just one of those horses It was just... He's so big and heavy, it's, that's the was the whole difficulty with transitions and things like that. And uh, So when you work these kind of big horses and all the people that, uh, that we see now having so much success um, with some of the uh, Swedish and Norwegian horses and things like that that are built a, a little plow horse-like, but if you get them fit, it's amazing how, how they totally transform into something that actually looks like an athlete. But a lot of those uh, colder-blooded horses, they go to fat very quickly, so you really have to stay on working them. So that was lovely. So after that, uh, that was a big breakthrough there in the Piaf. So we just come back and we gave him a walk a little bit. Notice how he stayed so relaxed throughout of this. Notice as soon as she touches the reins, her, his ears immediately just go back and start paying attention to her. This horse at the point now where he is really, you know, you can really see him trying. He loves the work he's doing. Um, he comes out every day and just, you know, the two of them seem like they're growing in sync all of the time. Now, you'll notice with Amber some things that people always point out when once we get into the trot work. And you notice how Amber is, is rather short, so her leg doesn't really come down where it, where it should be on the side of this horse. So her leg kind of lies right at the break of, uh, of his sides there a little bit in such a way that 
makes it very difficult for her to keep the leg very still. But the thing to notice is it's very relaxed. So her leg moves a bit, but it's totally relaxed. It's just like a wet noodle hanging around the horse is what we want to do. And of course, she's had to learn to compensate for that a little bit, because ideally, remember, we would like our leg to always hang below the brake in the side of the horse, you know, by about a foot or so. So you can see him just going into the trot here. Once again, he's a big horse. He just takes a minute to struggle. We're, you know, she was not trying to keep him, as you all hear me all the time. Don't bother. To, don't try to hold them in the frame in the transitions. You let, the, let it be what they're ready to do at that time and then perfect it later. So we get him into the trot. And of course, once he would warmed up in the trot, you would see that the transitions would be no problem. But that first little transition for him, being the kind of horse that he is, is a little difficult. So we let him get into it. And of course, we're going to go right into the stretch before we do anything else. So I always want to have the stretch before, uh, <clears throat> once I get it, as soon as I can in the, in the stretch work, so I'm ensured that the horse is over its back. And as you've heard me say many times, if I couldn't get the horse over its back, within a few moments I would have come right back to the walk. But I know that where this horse is now, and he's quite capable of getting there. It just always takes him a minute to, to get this big body working. Now, I also, uh, when I watched this video earlier, I thought about leaving my initial speaking on here, but there's a lot of plane noise, and it's kind of distracting and things and noise off in the distance. Um, so you could actually hear how little I say to Amber throughout all this, other than, you know, make it a little better here, a little pluck there. But I never try to micromanage anyone's ride. If I had to do that, I would know that they were not capable of riding. When I hear trainers, you know, right lane, left rein, left rein, left leg, right leg, you know, you can't ride somebody from the, you can't ride the horse for the person from the ground. You have to develop the right skills in the person so their instincts become correct in themselves. So you don't have to ride every step with the horse. I've never seen anyone ever taught in that way that ever actually got anywhere. So the rider has to develop each rider at their own, uh, at their own speed, you know, as they have, and the level of the fitness of their own bodies is so important. So it's that idea that you must let people develop. As long as everything's on the right track, and you know, we try to straighten out a few things in a lesson that's necessary. You know, with Amber at first, it was very much rolling her shoulders over. So she's really, really working very hard here to keep those shoulder blades flattened into her back because that was her tendency a little bit. But if you saw or go back and look at the earliest uh, pictures of, of our videos of her, you would see her leg now looks about two feet longer than it did originally. And that's by learning to relax and stretch the leg down in relaxation. But look how beautifully this horse is uh, just like a big giant ball rolling over the ground here when we see him trotting like this. You know, he's become so supple. And this is a very, very big horse, and like I said, with fairly straight hind legs. And you can see now that, that that's this perfect connection. Look how the, the trot just continues to step forward in that perfect rhythmic stride. You can pretty much, you know, almost set a metronome to this. How lovely she's balanced straight up above the horse there. Look how beautiful that neck comes out. So you can see the whole top line swinging, and look how free the shoulders are. Once again, look at where the neck is. Now, people who don't understand training, or correct training, they see a horse with his head down and say he's on the forehand, but look how this horse's front end is coming off the ground. He couldn't have that freedom of movement if his shoulders, if he wasn't coming off of the forehand. Because when they're on the forehand, they always stab their front legs into the ground because they're moving off of those front legs. But here, see how open that stride is, and how it springs up into the back with each stride carrying the horse forward. And once, once again, look how effortlessly this is. If you actually had to go somewhere on a horse, you know, and uh, you can see how important this is. I, I actually trained uh, a couple of pretty champion uh, endurance riders. Now, I'm happy to say they all gave up endurance riding after they learned more about riding, because the problem is with, with endurance riding, all the horses end up um, pretty lame by the end of it, going 50 miles in these kind of long endurance rides. And, uh, you know, as the people that I trained uh, got more into their horses and, uh, you know, they just realized how much, how much it was asking the horses to do. And I personally think it's too much. Because even the winners come back sore. You can believe that. So once again, look how beautifully he's stretching over that top line, swinging over his back. So we never want to try to bring them up until we get to that point. So then when, he, when we bring him up, you can see how he, like, uh, there's a little bit of hesitancy for just a moment, and then he comes right back up into the trot, never putting on the brakes. And once again, notice how his ears are back listening to her all the time with that relaxed sense. So now today we're going to start in just a working trot. So she's starting out here just in what I would call a working trot. 
But once again, look how big this is. I mean, most people, what they think they're working trot is this shortened little slow down thing. Look how ground covering it is. Look how he's stepping up right into the track of the front foot. And once again, notice with the double bridle how she's keeping that curb rein relaxed all the time. How beautifully he's flowing down the long side here. You can literally just see him, the compression in those hind legs. I mean, you'll see when he comes into collection a little bit here and gets more collected, you'll, you'll be able to see the thrust just sitting right down and pushing up into his back. So she's going to do a little medium trot here. Look how beautifully that flows forward. No hesitation in the stride, totally even. And all she does to regain the collection is just to stretch back up again. So her body lifts up a little bit and she slows down the rhythm. In other words, she no longer follows him in that bigger frame. So the horse learns to follow our back. That's why you must be so strong to do this work. I mean, there's no way you can ride at this level, folks, without being you know, in superior level of fitness. Beautifully comes back, still just working in the working trot here. That comes into a nice shoulder in. No change of rhythm, as you notice there. Beautiful stride on that, another medium trot. So it's so beautiful to watch, you can imagine. That's why it's like, for teachers who teach music, for instance, you know, there's two types of people who teach music. People who teach people to, for instance, move their fingers on the piano, like the kind of little old lady, uh, you know, teacher that m m many people, myself included, started playing the piano with when they were young. And, you know, I quit playing with that person very quickly because I couldn't stand it. But, uh, and there's people who really, a real music teacher, for instance, teaches the child to listen and to hear music, not to not to memorize finger patterns and things like this. So the same thing is true of the rider. That's why you can't, once you start playing the music, you, you must concentrate. That's why if you heard me teaching this lesson, I say very little. I simply am asking her what to do and giving her just a little pointers here and there. Because the horse should be working at a level where that's all I have to do, if that makes any sense, at whatever, right from the very beginning of training with the student. We have to let them develop. We can't develop for them or force them to do it any more than we can force the horses to do it. You can see right there, he gets a little bit tight from time to time. Once again, she asks, she gives him a little pluck underneath and he starts to lift a little more again. Now we're working on the half passes in the drop. So you can see the first one to the left here, he struggles a little bit. You can see how he tries to lift out of it. He can't quite say, stay totally connected over his top line. But do we beat him up and try to force him deeper into it? No. We come back to the stretch, realizing that his muscles just got tight. Once again, this is, this is the outside level. This, you know, we're pushing the envelope here a little bit this day and asking for everything. We got a good collected walk, we got a good collected trot, and we got a good collected canter. So that was a lot out of this horse. First time he's been able to put it all together on the same uh, on the same day, if you will. So with a big horse like this, some days we come out and we do a little stretch and a little trot work, and then we go right to the canter work because he he would find, especially the canter would really wear this horse out. Um, big heavy horse to get him over his back. So uh, we worked in the, for that way for the last uh, couple of years, really. So it's only now that he's being able to put this all together. But look how beautiful it is, and by virtue of the fact that we've done it the way we've done it, he should last for many many years. Now, now we begin to come back into a little more collection here. See how he gets a little bit more bounce off the ground at this point. Starts to elevate the forehand a little more. And the thing to watch also with this horse, you notice when, when he, and why, and it's also a real medium trot, when he does those medium trots, you'll see how the forehand actually lifts up and, the, and it actually thrusts upwards. 
So now we're going to go back and just repeat that again. So my rule of thumb is always, you know, the third time is charm. I never do anything, or it would be very, very rare, I'd ask course to do anything more than three times in a row. If I can't get it by then, we, uh, we move on to something else and come back to a stretch again and know that it will be better the next day. So this time it gets a little better in this direction. He holds his balance up underneath him a little better and gets a little stretch. And once again, she uses that technique of getting way back behind the motion. So she's literally lifting her seat out of the saddle and trying to give him a little bit of upwards thrust to see if she can get it out of him. If she does, good. If she didn't, we would just come back to the stretch. Now we get a nice medium trot on the diagonal. Notice how he floats up. So we do that to get him pushing up through his back a little bit more which you could obviously he did there. Once again, you can see how the forehand lifts it off the ground as he did the medium drop. So now she'll come back for a final try at the half pass. And here this time we get a little more bend. Struggles a little bit still, but it's a little more consistent. Struggling a little bit there. So that's it. We know that was enough for today, and that's an improvement. We had to, you know, she had to ask him a little bit more, you know, to do it, and he was able to sustain it, got a little tighter than I would like, but I know that the next time I try it, it will be even better than that. So we come right back to the stretch. He understood and tried the best he could. That's the thing we have to understand is when, does the, when is the horse trying the best he can? When it, when in, you know, and that's part of what, we, what used to be called equestrian tack. Now, once again, look how beautifully this ball starts rolling over the ground. Again, as he lengthens all the way to that pole, even in the stretch to the top line. Beautiful swinging trot. And once again, look how, you know, he's con uh, all the work he's done so far, He's just completely calm. There's no, he's not sweated. How regular his movement is. If you heard him breathing, you'd hear how completely regular and relaxed his breath is. And he was a horse, you know, for once again, because he was so big, um, he struggled quite a bit in the beginning. You know, he would be out of breath, literally. And as soon as you feel them struggling to breathe, you know, you always have to come back and let them off. So here she comes back into that little more collected trot. Now we did not do the biggest collected trot he's capable of today because I wanted to get through everything and not push the collection to its degree, so to speak, which we might on another day. So a good trainer is always thinking about what's the best thing for the horse today so that I end up where I want to be tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, if you will. So now we come back to the half pass on this side, which is really quite regular and about as good as the other one was on the other side. And so that's enough of that. We don't need to repeat it again. We always kind of keep gauging and thinking like this, okay? Because we've got to remember your time spent training a horse. You've only got so much time before the horse is exhausted every day. So think about, well... And once again, learning to read the horse and knowing the horse that you have. It's a big, heavy horse is going to be able to sustain work um, a less period of time than, than one that's a lighter kind of uh, hot-blooded kind of horse that develop uh, a lot of stamina very quickly. For those of you who don't know why that is, hot horses have their veins closer to the skin, so in their chest. That's why their veins all stick out. It's a really nice stride across that diagonal, nice and consistent. Now, beautiful trot. Now, look how completely perfect the flexion is in the neck. Notice how completely relaxed the underside of the neck is and how he begins to lift even more off the ground. So, again, notice the relaxation in the curb rein. Yes, he has a double bridle on, but there's no backwards tension on the curb rein. So only once or twice when during the canter work in the, uh, that we'll get to that she has to take a little feel of it. It gets a little bit tense. But look at the compression in the hind legs now as he goes down this and the bounce upwards. And now she's going to come back this time in and do an extended shot. 
That's a little bobble there. That was the fourth ball to the ring there. But we can see now that he's able to now do these extended and medium gates and come through from behind so he doesn't lower in front. Remember, in the lower levels, the horse always has to be let go a little bit more on the forehand when we do the lengthening of stride just because it doesn't have the strength to hold itself up. So you saw there, once again, he, this old habit of his, when we first got him, when you tried to canter this horse, he would throw his head straight in the air every, and then bolt. So he still has that little tendency, but we don't fight him about it. You know, we get him in the canter, and it has just disappeared over time. And by the time he's uh, going to pre-St. George, which I think will be not that long from now, um, you'll see that all that will have disappeared. Look how beautifully he stays uphill in this canter. Once again, even in the canter work now, we see that same kind of compression in the hind legs that we saw in the trot going down that long side. When we started this horse, literally, he could barely canter even in this 80-foot ring. He couldn't canter in a dressage ring at all. So you see how he gets a little tight, and she has to keep a little more bend to the outside than we'd like to be to have in that counter canter. But he stays there quite nicely and is consistent, and she's able to, you know, she doesn't have to keep that pressure on for long before she can release it. Now, the reason this has become a little difficult, too, is because we've started flying changes on this horse, which he's now doing quite well. But... Uh, he, he was, the, once again, because of his bolting problem in the canter, when you asked him for a flying change, he would try to bolt with you. Um, so that took a while to work that out, but it has worked out beautifully, and he's now starting to do the changes absolutely fantastically, and I'm sure it will not be long before they're completely confirmed and we can start tempi changes with him now that he's at this point. You know, once you get a horse to the point where, like this one is, where they can totally connect beautifully over the top line, uh, the rest is easy, like everything else. If the horse is physically prepared to do the job, we're asking it to do it, you know, it should be able to do that job easily without a big struggle. If it can't, you're on the wrong track. It's as simple as that. And once again, just to realize, you know, once you've ridden horses over their backs and feel how wonderfully secure, you know, and I see children riding around on upside-down horses going to fences, and I go to horse show these days and see, you know, ambulances leaving left and right with these people that they're taking to the hospital and how many international jumper riders we have had killed uh, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, and everybody's acting like this is some big mystery. I can tell you exactly why it's happening. There are forces, for forces to jump, and they're hollow, and when they do, they land in the middle of the fences and they flip over on people. A nice transition there. Has a little bit of a struggle, but he comes right back up into that lovely, lovely place in the back. And actually now is when we're doing the extended try. He's going to come through a little bit more here. Right now, if he overreaches a little bit more. So once again, for him to be able to make these transitions from that collected canter right into that collected trot and right into that medium trot, you know, that's when you know the horse is really starting to sustain, be able to have the strength to sustain all this over his back. So and this is the first day he's achieved this. Oh, he steps right up and how uphill this canter is. Beautifully connected, beautifully three beat. And once again, you can see how once in a while he gets and wants to get a little tight, and she just finesses him right back there again. And that's why, you know, we always do as it gets, as they get more and more trained, that just becomes easier and easier. But you can see he's giving her very little trouble about anything that we're doing here today, and his light in the reins, and just absolutely lovely. How logical, I hope you can see how this whole progression of what we've done has been. So she was just going into the counter of the counter there. Now you see how she has to hold him a little tighter than I would like her to have to. That's because he's trying to struggle to switch the lead. So it's just going to be a couple of weeks more of him just struggling with that, but not terribly. He came through it very nice. So we had a few days of struggling. Once he realized, tried to do flying changes, it was like that's all he wanted to do, which is a very often thing, often the thing. But I'm very pleased with the way he helped that. So I know next time I come back to the flying changes, he's ready to start doing that. Really nice downwards transition there. Got a little tight in his neck during that, but not bad. And here we come to even a bigger extended trot. He really swings over his back. And once again, to keep working through these exercises at this level for him and be able to come back and maintain that position over his back, that's what's hard. People don't understand that, you know, collection is the degree to which to the horse's level of strength. If the horse loses, if you take two weeks off and the horse loses some muscle tone, you lose the ability to collect or some degree of the ability to collect that you have to gain back again. It's as simple as that. It's, you know, collection is not a trick. It's a, it's a level of physical conditioning. 
that allows it to happen. So you can see there he was starting to get a little bit uh, tired, so we come back to a final stretch here. But I couldn't have been happier with him during out this lesson to be able to maintain that and how beautifully Amber like take, took him through and the finesse that she's starting to ride with, how she quickly works with him to solve the problems. As I said, I really feel like these two are now really becoming a partnership where I think he really tries for it. I mean, you can see he hasn't, um, you know, there's never an angry or tense step other than a little, little canner thing there where he gets a little tight about that. But once again, right into that relaxation, he trusts her. Now we come right back. Remember, we're with, the stretch refreshes the muscles. You know, collection is about just like you're, like engaging a muscle. You tighten the muscle a bit, hopefully without tension, which is the hard part of all that. It's easy to you know flex your muscles and be tense and hold them hard. It's it's a different thing to flex them and be flexible at the same time. So a beautiful big swing over his back there. So by coming back to this last stretch, we're just letting the horse get all the blood flowing back through his body, bring all the nutrients and the oxygen back into his top line again. Letting everything flow. So you notice, in, and when we work, and this is how it always is when I work, you know, I, I want every student at its level to keep working, to, to learn to play the music, so to speak, not to just sit and talk about it. I see so much of riding lessons as people pontificating nonsense, in even, and if it's not nonsense, it's maybe un, not even useful information for the person at the level that they're trying to trying to work and you know wanting to talk their way through it. You know, you've got to ride your way through it. So look how beautifully now he comes back into that collection after letting him refresh those muscles again. And now he looks like a new boy, like he looked rather tired a couple of moments ago after all that. But now he looks like he's totally refreshed again and like you could keep going. As Amber said at the end of this, she said, well, I felt like I could just keep going and going. And that's exactly what it feels like. Now once again, look at the compression in the hind legs now. Look at the perfect connection. And once again, look at this horse's back behind the saddle. That's what a horse that looks like is uh, correctly trained looks like. They, there is no hole behind the saddle. They're not built that way. Horses develop those holes from bad riding. Look how beautifully he straightens out here. And we'll notice, look how straight he's trotting right here. Once a horse gets over its back, you don't have to struggle to make them straight. They just are straight. So now she's going to make a halt for us. And look how nicely he flows through that turn. But this size, of, this horse is about 18 hands. Now look how she'll just stretch up, and he steps right into a perfect square halt. No tension. Absolutely beautiful ride. Amber's done such a great job with him, and uh, congratulations to her. But I want to keep you guys all seeing what your goal is. This is where you're going to get to if you keep doing the work that you're doing. This is Will Faber from Archer Ride with Amber Matusik and Legolas. See you all next time.